Welcome. <laughs> we wanted to talk today a little bit about the importance of interconnectedness, the importance of really embodying that sense of being connected to others, uh, which is a, a topic that has been um, sort of in our face for the last six months or so with the coronavirus first and now with protests worldwide, um, that we seem to be in a time in history where it is really being presented to us that how we interface with others is of vital importance. And when we start interfacing with others, we're uh, impacted also by the way we interface within our own embodied experience with our self. Um, and selves. Selves, perhaps. yeah, probably. <laughs> we have multiple selves. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so an angle that we started looking at today is, um, is the idea of how the Nadi system plays into this, and then looking also at where some of the texts, like the Bhagavad Gita, um, sort of give us some guidance in how to really drop into an embodied space of being connected to others. Hmm. So the Nadis. Oh, the Nadis. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are they anyway? Yeah, what are they? Good question. I think um, we should keep investigating that. Um, so Nadi means a little river, like a rivulet. And a nada is a big river. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so, if you have a, either a big river or a little rivulet, uh, it is defined by the fact that you have uh, at least two things that the water can flow between. And so there's a flow, and then there's something that defines it that doesn't flow, or it doesn't flow as easily. Like the bank. Like the banks of a river. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Not so, the bank of America, but the, yeah. the banks. <laughs> yeah. Those two. Those two. Okay. Um, and so the... Um, and, and then, of course, with yoga, we have the, the question of the nadis. And most yoga practitioners say, oh, my, my nadis are cleaned out or my nadis are all plugged up, I have naughty nadis or, you know. And so, what are we talking about? Um, and so, when we talk about being embodied in yoga, we're not just referencing, you know, that which we obviously think is ourselves, this body, you know, which is this chunk of bones and flesh. We do mean that, but to be embodied or to touch the ground is a com common thing, to be grounded, uh, is really feeling, having a direct experience of that which we all share. Uh, for example, the environment, uh, so, or the planet Earth, you know, in terms of our physical embodiment. And we all share other environments. Uh, important, you know, there are also online environments, information environments, but we share them and um, they tend to form structures. Okay, and then intelligence is when the structure uh, doesn't quite in include itself. You know, so you just have a framework and a framework can't possibly include itself. It always leaves something out and that we call residue or shesha and the metaphor for shesha classically is water um, because it flows easily and water will just keep flowing and flowing and flowing through you know all kinds of little complex uh, areas of the the jungle and then it'll flow clearly towards the lowest point so water flows down so the lowest point would be the ocean Hmm. Then, so within our body, we have what we call the middle path. 
Okay, and at least we've thought about it. Plum, if you have good posture and you're standing or sitting quite straight, it corresponds to the plumb line. Um, and it's the, when you balance all of the little nadis, the little rivulets, around uh, finding the complementary opposite. Of, so you have a, a, a sensation pattern, a story pattern, and then you find its complementary opposite. Uh, then, uh, or you experience that it has a complementary opposite, then you balance your physical in the experience of embodiment around the central channel. Uh, and so what you're experiencing then intuitively, vis viscerally, if that's the correct word, you're getting that vi sense of vibratory interconnectedness with that which we all share which is each other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, you're, whether, like it or not, uh, we're all interconnected. We're all actually, uh, from some ways of explaining it, we're all the same being. Oh. <laughs> yeah, don't think about that too hard. <laughs> yeah, if you think about it, the thoughts you have about that, like good or bad, oh, we're, you know, I'm a good being, but not them. Uh, um, the thoughts, those form the banks of little rivers. Um, and so eventually, everything is flowing to the big river, uh, which we call the middle path. And or often, the channel. we think about you know, cleaning the nadis and, and, and in yoga, that's the thing, you know, I'm just going to go home and clean my nadis. And um, what is really being referred to there is this idea of. Uh, uh, opening space through the conscious use of mind and breath and imagination and opening these uh, spaces within the body so that you know it, it's you can call it energy flow or um, sensation flow or breath flow is smooth and um, and and working towards the central uh, sensation along the plumb line of the body. Yeah. And so they say, if, if you have um, what we would technically call a disembodied uh, storyline, <laughs> which many embodied beings have. At least a few times a day. Yeah, at least <laughs> <laughs> about 10 times every minute, okay. Um, so any of our storylines where, you're, oh, you know, wonderful me, or poor me, or poor you, or too much of this, too much of that. And um, all of that is, is conceptual theory making, which in itself is quite amazing to observe. And important to do. Yeah. And um, the problem is we identify with it. We, through the clever ego function of the mind, we think, oh, that's me. And we have many of these stories of me. Uh, every story has a pattern in the embodiment or the sensation patterns that are stored as the uh, samskara of physical embodiment. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have many, many little rivulets that are dead end, perhaps that's the right term, but these are dead ends. They're plugged up little uh, swamps uh, off somewhere in the jungle. Um, that don't make it, the flow just doesn't make it uh, to the great cleansing channel, the middle path. Um, and then you'll have certain vital embodied nadis uh, that correspond literally to uh, long nerve patterns within your hopefully still functioning body. Okay, and so you'll, and oftentimes we'll begin our practice by finding those nadis that have to do with our actual embodiment. Mm -hmm. you know, just practically, you know, how you practically deal with gravity, how you deal with light and sound and uh, taste and form. And so those, and we deliberately watch them. So we try to stimulate them and watch them. And then in that process, uh, as we 
start to let go and reveal the whole, uh, the nadis that are not behaving well, that are either plugged up or overstimulated uh, due to uh, anger or due to uh, extreme craving for immortality or anxiety, anxiety or mm. full of uh, hatred yeah. for uh, certain things or for other beings. Um, these, they start to, we get in touch with the, just the sensations that they're associated with. Okay, and that's the, the beauty of the embodiment practice. And, and one way that they are reflected in the body too is that when you have, and we've kind of talked about this in other weeks here recently, but when you have these nadis that are not functioning um, well, then that's, that's sort of an energetic or breath or sensation pattern. Um, and then the actual physical body, um, meaning your musculature, your fascia, connective. Yeah. your connective tissue, uh, follows that pattern so that if, and then it becomes reinforced by the embodied form of your physical body, um, which is why sometimes in yoga practice, after people do huge backbends and they're newer students or sometimes older students as well, suddenly there's a wave of emotion that surges up in you or, or any kind of movement can, can do that to you because it's as though the connective tissue and and it probably has, has started to move in patterns and ways that it hasn't been allowed to move for a long, long, long yes. time. And this begins with the nadis, with this uh, more, much more subtle level within the embodied experience that mm -hmm. is mind-related, imagination-related, and also very grounded through the breath and awareness. Yeah. So one of the ways we meditate on sensation or, or prana in the body is we uh, connect, you know, deliberately. Uh, and sometimes that involves the imagination and then we find connections that are almost pre-imaginative or they're built into the, uh, into the brain, into the imagination. And then as you do that and you're starting to touch into the sensation patterns of samskaras that maybe you haven't touched into for the last 10,000 lifetimes or at least the last few years. Um, if you are in the middle of practice, you have created a context where you see those sensations as special or unique or as sacred and you are able to, rather than go off on the story, you're able to just watch the sensation patterns. And in watching the sensation patterns, you're almost cutting that which feeds, you're reversing the flow and you're no longer feeding the, the neurotic storyline. And, and you're cleaning your nadis. And that's actually the way the nadis get, the, the serious thing, get clean by like, like, and you're watching the base sensation patterns of suffering. And uh, it takes a lot of courage, but it's also, I was going to say inspiring, but that's a little bit too, too <laughs> So this reminds me of, in, in the beginning of the, the Bhagavad Gita, of the Mahabharata, um, um, there you have these two armies facing each other. And if you uh, are at all familiar with the the story. These are huge armies uh, full of people that we already know from you know, many, many volumes and chapters before that. And we know all of the deep family stories of all of them. And you have this huge battle forming. Um, and on one side there's basically uh, the bad guys uh, who are you know, under the, the heel of a, a person who's kind of a psychopath. It happens Durya occasionally Dhan. in history. Yeah, this, it happens <laughs> with uh, commanders and heads of state and, you know, 
I've heard about it. Yeah. And on the other side, uh, you, you have uh, basically the good guys. Uh, and our, our hero, Arjuna, uh, uh, is there with... And he has his very close pal and friend, who also happens to be Krishna, uh, who is the vibrant, uh, beloved, he was the center of the central channel in the heart of all beings. Just happens to be there. <laughs> and so, and just before the fight, and Arjuna, of course, is a, uh, a princely warrior, and he's, you know, all... So this is his dharma. His, this is, you know, yeah, he's, his, been, he's been trained in it. He's, been, he's, practic- he's really good at the martial arts. And basically, he's also very ethical with them. In other words, he uh, does it for the, the good of, he applies it for the good of others rather than for the greed for the kingdom. And he says, hmm, and he's all charged and uh, he has excellent posture, by the way, Arjuna. You know, so it's hard to be, if you have really good posture, it's hard to go off onto extreme neuroses because it, they usually distort the posture in some way. Okay, but if you sit straight, then you go back to the sensation base of the shared reality that you know, gives you that intuition um, that you should pay attention. And so he asks Krishna to pull him up on between the two armies. And so the chariot, which was represented by the body, is pulled up in this middle path between these two huge armies. and. Uh, Arjuna starts to look around and everybody is all, you know, set to go. They all, you know, they have their songs and their music. They're basically their mantras. And so every cult on each side is all, and they blow their conch shells. They blow them before he asks to... Before he starts Yeah, so this is, this is an interesting point in the Gita where, you know, they're they see the, this battlefield and, and he and Arjuna and Krishna hear in the distance the sound of conch shells being blown and it's almost as though, you know, they have been programmed to hear that sound and, and it's like, okay, let's charge. And um, they then say, okay, we're ready and they blow their conch shells and at that Point. And this is actually a tradition in many yeah to begin in many cultures where, to you know, begin and end many things. You know, it's like the, all the soldiers are chanting or they're singing their favorite songs and and so when he blows the conch shell and when uh, Krishna blows his, there's this you know resonance of sound and there's a resonance of that sound and that vibration that he experiences within his own physical embodied experience. And the combination of that, we're saying, the combination of that resonance, which actually is a way of sort of shaking out the nadis, along with the fact that he's doing a big, long exhale to get this really good conch shell sound. If you don't have a conch shell. Yeah. Okay, you should get it. Um, you can pretend you have one. <laughs> but you have to extend it, so you, it's not going to be effective if it's like just like 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And you have to really good feel one the minute. vibration. Yeah, and it has to be like piercing so that all the sentient beings within, you know, within a kilometer in all directions start to tremble because of the, the sound. Okay. So that's a practice that's available. <laughs> and so it's, Even today. it's at that point that he suddenly says, wait a minute, because he, his programming to be the warrior, to be the one who just dashes in his adrenaline that's getting mm-hmm. him ready to just go and fight, that all drifts off you know, into the background because he's waking up to the present moment. Yeah, and he actually feels, metaphorically, the middle path and he starts to like, his intelligence is vibrant and he goes, whoa, wait a minute. And uh, he sees 
that these two armies, and this is actually true in the story, they're actually not two armies, but they're all, you know, people from different tribes or different small kingdoms, but they're actually all related. It's actually one big family. And so, ooh. And then he sees that on both sides, there are uh, some of his teachers on both sides, and some, a lot of his friends on both sides. He knows, sees the complexity of it. And, uh, and, but just the fact that he saw that it was only one family. Uh, so all, all sentient beings are actually one family. So That's he had people this don't like the Gita, experience right? of Gita. interconnectedness. He had the experience. The, and then and he it starts wiped to say, him out. Yeah, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm not going to... You know, and he started asking smart questions. Mm -hmm. uh, because he didn't want to do the obvious, what a lot of people think, uh, the, the obvious teaching of the Gita is, uh, particularly, is that if you're a soldier or if you're a, a policeman or something, you should just shut up and do your duty. And don't worry about killing all these beings because they're as good as dead anyway because all beings are going to die anyway. And so that kind of uh, true but uh, out of context non-dual argument is made with, and so Krishna makes that argument in very brilliant, says true things but not in the context. He doesn't answer Arjuna's dilemma. And then you have unfolding in the the Gita, this dialectic, which is a conversation, communication between uh, Arjuna and Krishna, in which they start looking at everything and Arjuna spends most of the time getting confused. And Krishna, who's very clever, if you really, he's deliberately giving him answers that are not going to be satisfactory to the actual circumstances. And so Arjuna says, wait a minute, you just said this, which is actually, and it's quite, a, it's a torturous book in that sense, <laughs> that it's, it's going to bring up all of the feelings of the samskaras, which are all of, in the, if the reader gets into it, or it's going to bring up what they call the hala hala, or the, the poison of samsara, and you have to like, really with sincerity, uh, go into that dialogue of the middle path, which is of, you know, what is this interconnectedness to all beings? And what is and the context in yeah. this very moment? What is happening right now that uh, then I can use to take action? Because in a situation like the Gita or a situation like any of us find ourselves in day in and day out where there is a complex situation or a situation of conflict or a situation of fear. Uh, you know, we have these same patterns arising in our nervous system and in our minds. And if we get grounded, then we see, oh, we have to look at the context beyond our own belief system, beyond our dharma, what we believe our dharma to be, beyond our, you know, the theories of, oh, well, it's all impermanent and therefore things don't matter, so just go kill people. Um, and to really say what is appropriate for this circumstance now, which takes, as Richard said, it takes the courage to keep the central channel open within our own embodied experience and to keep the sensation patterns, the nadis, flowing freely so that we stay awake um, to what's informing us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's easier to say. Than uh, to do. <laughs> to do most of the time. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and we face, we face that which um, has to do ultimately with uh, the deeper samskaras in the body have to do then with relationships with other beings. Uh, because that's where the real value comes. Mm -hmm. uh, not that, and, and so the initial non-dual teaching, which is very true that all beings, you know, will die anyway, and uh, 
no one ever truly dies, no one is ever truly born, it's just the gunas of prakriti acting on the gunas of prakriti, so what's your problem? <laughs> um, but then, within that, you know, the, it's very skillfully, very gradually, uh, crafted to say, well, what really matters for is that the gunas of prakriti in the, the, the storylines of time and space and of family and of relationship uh, become the story of love mm-hmm. or become the story of compassion and the realization of interconnectedness. And therefore, all of the action of the Swadharma for Arjuna or the true, that means the true duty, not just the duty that uh, perhaps society has given you or the, uh, the, the governor has given you or the, uh, the psychopath has given you. Um, the one I'm thinking of. Um, but the, perhaps that's not your actual duty. That is perhaps in some context what you should do so as just to not hurt anybody else unnecessary. But the true duty for Arjuna or something is he has to look into it and he has to make a decision as to what to do and then without any motive for his own self, he acts not being 100% sure even because you know, but then if he's if he's not motive if he is without motivation uh, for ego enhancement or something, then feedback comes <laughs> in the form of other beings or saying, "Hey, that didn't quite work," or "That hurt," or even the environment will give you feedback. You know, you burn something, you pollute the air, and you know, the, then you end up coughing and hurting other beings, that's feedback. And so then with the feedback, if you're not like full of too much ego in your own system, uh, then you're willing to adjust the system right away because the system, that is impermanent. It's going to die anyway. And so you will adjust your theories, your hypotheses, you'll adjust the frameworks, knowing that they are constructions. And knowing that and they're then, connected. Oh, that works a little bit yeah. better. Yeah. And eventually the nadis will flow, the water will take it all with it. Yeah. Uh-huh. And there's, you know, the Gita is just this remarkable, beautiful text. Um, and it's one like so many others that you really need to read, digest a little bit of it and then put it down and then pick it back up and read more for your whole life. Um, and, and one of the ways that, that, you know, as we've been working on this project on the Gita this year that I just fell so much more in love with um, in the description in the Gita, one of the ways Arjuna really learns to experience this the sense of interconnectedness is that section when he it's like when he is seeing all of the different forms that Krishna takes um, mm. from the you know wonderful forms that are beyond any imagination to the simplest of forms oh, yeah. and I love that part okay. yeah that kind of begins you know, it's, it's implied, but it really begins very clearly in, I think, the eighth chapter, mm-hmm. where Krishna is saying, you know, all of this is me. You know, it's... Um, the whole world. Yeah, everything. the whole world is me. And, uh, but you're not paying, basically, you don't pay attention. And so, and a nice one is, I am the taste of water. Uh, I am the light of the sun and the moon. Uh, I am... Pranava, Sarva Vedic, I am the, the vibrant sound, it's Pranava, which some people think is Om, and others don't think that. An interesting conversation. Okay, they think it's not sound Om, but it's the hum of the Om. Mm, that's the Pranava, and it's expressed linguistically as Om, but it's that sound. Uh, then, Shabdake, 
I am the I am sound within K, which means space, open space. Um, meaning, I am sound itself. So, probably you're hearing sound right now, huh? but you're distracted by the apparent meaning or lack of meaning <laughs> in the words. And the, but the sound itself is inutterably mysterious and sacred. And we should say, I am that sound. Okay. And just like the sensa- any sensation you're having, that is Krishna, or that is the mysterious, whatever, you know, the, the vibrance of the interpenetration of, of true being. Yeah. Um, and the fact that, that the first part is that I am the taste of water is what is so amazing, because that really brings it, brings them off of the pedestal of being, you know, some great uh, God that is beyond all of us, but that you know, he is the taste of water. And that makes you, you know, when you look deeply at that, it allows you to see your own um, connection to all of these manifestations yourself. A direct connection. A direct connection. It's just like I, I want a direct line to the emperor. Okay. And <laughs> Don't want to go that through. One. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the fact is because uh, according to the the center of your heart, there it is, and in fact, center of every being's heart, and so they don't actually have to go through the structural hierarchy that uh, complex and perhaps useful religious systems have prescribed, in which sometimes they're designed to make you study stuff, and so you're saying, no, you should go do this and this and this and this, but actually you have a direct line to the. Ex- but all of them are teaching you, why don't you pay attention to what's actually arising mm-hmm. with, you know, with the sharp intelligence, with a little bit of compassion. And so that it comes out that way. Mm. And so that's where the naughties go, and that's where they come into play, is mm-hmm. they, you know, again and again and again, we come back to visualizing them or feeling the vibratory sensation, and then we can wake up. Mm. Just even a tiny bit, and then we go back asleep for, you know, five yeah. minutes or ten days or, or lifetime. a few lifetimes. Yeah, and, but, but, you know, yoga is something that really relies on being, you know, doing a lot of practice, but also being patient, um, so that you're not grasping at these ideas, but that you are really doing them at whatever pace it is that is going to get you, that's going to really put you in the state that Arjuna was in, where when he realized, you know, this sense of interconnectedness, as Richard said, and, you know, he's someone with great posture, he just kind of... Oh, at the beginning? At the beginning yeah, of the he story. he actually slumped. He slumped. Which were, Someone like him was like, it's like, yeah. And then he couldn't even hold his bow, and his bow fell out of his hand. He's... <laughs> and, uh, and of course, then the, the initial reaction to the reader who, who'd been reading the endless chapters of the story and he says, What? <laughs> you know, come on, this is, <laughs> what are your friends going to think? You know? And so, more or less, the superficial but the obvious things that actually go through everyone's mind when they do experience that collapse. And then we start to look and look and look deeper and look again. So there's an, so this whole process of embodiment or being able to watch what is actually arising uh, and learning to um, not hold on to the formulas uh, that the teachings come in, all of the different systems, uh, all of the different uh, techniques, structures that teaching is given through various different dharmas, and Krishna is actually laying them out in different chapters, and then laying them out in a way that points out the this isn't the whole. You know, you and he wants Arjuna to like question it, and finally in the eleventh chapter, the very the, the big famous chapter, uh, Arjuna is feeling pretty. Uh, 
pretty good that he understands it. He's spunky. Yeah, he's being a little spunky, maybe, you know, just a tiny drop of, you know, pride he's got it. <laughs> and he says, oh, uh, I got it totally. Uh, like a lot of yoga people, you know, you, 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 you finally relax <laughs> for two minutes, you know, on your meditation because you think, I'm enlightened now, you know, and you pull out your selfie stick and get busy. <laughs> uh, so Arjuna, and he, he asked Krishna, do you think, he asked, do you think uh, uh, I could actually see uh, what you're talking about? Um, you know, he wanted the direct experience, which was kind of famous. And so, and Krishna says, well, you can't see with ordinary eyes, because he wants to see infinity. And of course, you can see infinity with ordinary eyes, but you don't see that you're seeing infinity, so you're not seeing. And so he says, but I'll give you the divine eye. And so, and many different schools have different interpretations as to what that means. And so, but he does that, he, he blesses uh, out of his blessing, which is, in other words, not a mechanical way, you, you can't follow cause and effect to get that blessing or that compassion where all of a sudden you kind of get it. You get the synthesis because the synthesis is not a result of a mechanical process, but it's the magnetic attraction between. Anyway, then. And Arjuna starts to see in what, it, by that time, in the context of the previous chapters, as he starts to see in the body of the God of Gods. But he's already learned in the previous chapters that the body is his body. And he starts to see in his body the Vishvarupa, or the universal form, all the gods, goddesses, demons, worlds. And it's quite awesome at first. And it freaks him out. And eventually it freaks him out, because the naughties are not quite <laughs> naughty naughties. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So. So it's, it's uh, and, and when he gets freaked out by it, he, it's, it's this inability to really stick with it is what has happened yeah. to him. And he becomes totally afraid again, just like at the very beginning of the text. He loses it again. And again, the solution is his friendship, his trust, his friendship with his pal, who happens to be Krishna. And then, um, and then a request he had, he wanted to see Krishna in his ordinary form, which of course is extraordinary but within the context of having an infinite number of heads in which you're eating all sentient beings for snacks. Um, uh, he's just seeing the, the ordinary, uh, friendly form, the, the middle form. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, then he gets it again, and by the very end, he's relaxed and he says, ah. So the fantastic Vishwarupa is not, you know, it is infinite, but you're already experiencing yeah. it. So it's not necessary that you look. have these far out experiences. It's, it's the taste of water again, in a way. It is the ordinary that actually is more extraordinary than, than the your idea of the what is extraordinary. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's so beautifully... Slippery. Yeah. 